Hi, everyone. My name is Josh Kermse. I'm a JDMS. Uh, in my third year here, I'll be presenting Accidental Climate Policy, the Builder's Remedy in Santa Monica. So first, just a little bit about me. I'm in the Sustainable Built Environment track. Uh, I was born and raised in the Bay Area. I'm really passionate about sort of California climate, housing, and uh, Affordability issues, this is a photo from the California State Senate uh, floor from the time I was there where we had an elementary school visit uh, whose elementary school had been heavily affected by the Woolsey Fire in 2018. We asked folks to raise their hands if they'd had their family affected by the fire and all the hands in the room went up and that was a really beautiful moment of solidarity, I think, for folks in that community to get to see their advocates in Sacramento caring about the issues that affect them the most and that's what I'm here to talk about today. So what's the need? First, housing policy is climate policy in consequence but often not in design. Where we live affects the emissions that we generate, primarily through the amount that we drive and the energy efficiency of our homes. But oftentimes our laws, especially our state laws, are blind to those impacts, at least consciously uh, not written in a way that's trying to be actively aware of the way that our housing growth patterns affect climate change. And I think this is in part because policymakers need better data and resources to be able to assess the climate impacts of housing policy. We have a lot of excellent metrics and a lot of other important sort of value areas of housing policy like affordability and equity. We have worse data and we have worse decision making tools when it comes to climate. And that's part of where I think this project comes in. We need to make climate impacts an integral part of housing planning. And I think we do that through a number of steps. The first is that we need really good research to be able to provide to decision makers so that when they're making choices about where housing is going to be cited in their localities, what types of state policies we need to incentivize housing in different places, they're able to make those decisions with a full view of the climate impacts of all those choices. And eventually we need to have our laws reflect the urgency of the climate crisis when it comes to housing growth. So that's part of what I'm interested in doing here today. I'm interested in assessing the greenhouse gas impacts of the builder's remedy in Santa Monica. Some of those words don't mean anything yet. They're going to mean something in a second. So first, what's the builder's remedy? We're going to do California housing growth law in 60 seconds. Get excited. So first, <laughs> first, the state every eight years or so will generate population growth forecasts called the regional housing needs determinations. And they'll send these forecasts to regional governments that most people have never heard of but have a lot of power in this realm. Those regional governments' job is to get together. They're usually comprised of local elected officials in the region that are sent to the regional government by their board of supervisors or their city councils. And they allocate the regional housing share that they've received to all the localities in a really fascinating political process without a ton of uh, state rules. And localities receive those, and it's their job to plan for the housing share that they've been given by the region in a housing element. If they have a compliant housing element, which is sort of a more robust area of law now than it has been previously. Um, and it involves having to affirmatively, affirmatively further fair housing in your housing element. And I think the most fascinating part of that work is you have to inventory every site in your city that is going to accommodate the housing growth that you are mandated to have. Like you have to go site by site and identify where all those housing units are going to be. And if you, if the state deems you compliant in the housing element that you submit, you're good to go. If you're non-compliant, then in the period when you're non-compliant, the builder's remedy applies. The builder's remedy says, if you own a parcel in that, in that city, you can develop housing at essentially whatever density or height you'd like, as long as 20% of the units in that building are affordable. So that's a small, often time limited, but huge revolution in land use law in California that takes land use powers from the city and gives them to the developer, the affordable housing developer in these circumstances. And that interacts with our notions of of climate change and greenhouse gas planning in a really important way. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the science now. So there's a, a, a excuse me a string of great papers around carbon footprint planning, which is a hard phrase to say. So I'm going to avoid it from now on. It essentially thinks about greenhouse gases from the household level. Oftentimes you think about them from the sector level, like the industrial sector produces this much greenhouse gas, the uh, building sector produces this much greenhouse gas. Carbon footprint planning thinks about greenhouse gases from the household consumption perspective. So how many greenhouse gases are you helping to emit by having a gas heater as opposed to an electric heater? And this is a map of the GHG intensity of households in census tracts all around the Los Angeles area, Santa Monica being right here. And you'll see Santa Monica generally has a lower uh, carbon intensity per household than a lot of the other areas in the region. And many of the policies that you'd want to enact in order to bring that greenhouse gas intensity down over time involve changes within the household. Again, you want to go from gas heating to, uh, you know, to, uh, to zero carbon heating. But there are some important changes, namely urban infill, that are about moving households from areas in the state that are high intensity to areas in the state that are low intensity. 
which primarily means moving households through housing growth from areas that have long commutes and, and energy inefficient buildings to areas that have shorter commutes that make it easier to walk and bike and that have more energy efficient buildings, which usually means that they have smaller buildings. So that's urban infill. And that's a, this is a chart here of the sort of uh, greenhouse gas reduction potential in Santa Monica where you'll see urban infill is this very big bar that has a lot of opportunity to contribute to our fight against climate change. So we want to combine those two here. We want to take all the builder's remedy projects we know about in Santa Monica. We have 15. And which are expected to produce like 4,600 units of housing. It'd be a huge growth for the city. And we want to compare the census tract by census tract emissions data that we have from these planning models to see if the projects that have been proposed are in areas in Santa Monica that we expect to be better for our climate prospects than other areas. And just as a sort of initial matter, Santa Monica in general in these models is an area where we expect we want more housing to be built. So it's less a question of whether or not it'll be detrimental overall for housing to be built in Santa Monica and more whether we're really maximizing our opportunities. And the good news, rarely good news in climate, so we can be happy about that, is that we are. The average tract in Santa Monica, we expect to have about a 1,500 tons per ton CO2 equivalent uh, urban infill gain. And the average builder's remedy tract, which is a census tract where a builder's remedy project has been proposed, has over 2,000. So it's about 30 to 35% better for urban infill gains than the average tract. The catch, always a catch when there's good news on climate, is that it's, if you weight it by units, if you look at all these projects and you weight the urban infill benefits by the size of the project in each of these tracts, it's still higher than the average, but it comes down to something like 1650. And we'll talk a little bit about examples of that here. And this is a map of all these projects, darker blue, if they're in very high GHG reduction potential areas, and all the way up to yellow, if they're in moderate areas. Um, and for folks who might, not, who might not be able to see the colors, generally, really dark blue down here, light blue in here, and a big yellow dot up there that I'm going to talk about. So first, at a broad level, almost every project was proposed in an above average infill area. That's good news for climate in Santa Monica. No, project were, no projects were proposed in sprawl zones, which are areas of Santa Monica where we wouldn't expect really any climate benefits for moving housing, usually because it's on the city outskirts and folks have to drive in. And the houses are larger, and so they're less energy efficient. But there's one huge project that I'll talk about in a bit that could drag down otherwise major climate gains. And is an example of when you have climate blind housing policy, the sort of perils that you could get into that weigh down your attempt to maximize your urban infill gains. So first, we'll talk about the good. This is one of the projects here. It's project number three, 1215 19th Street. This is a 34-unit apartment building that's been proposed. All the units are deed-restricted affordable housing. It's in an extremely high infill gain area. So we expect this housing not just to be available to folks who previously would have a hard time living in Santa Monica, but folks who would have shorter commute times, who'd be able to walk and bike more, who'd have more energy efficient homes. The less good, which is my scientific phrase, is 3030 Nebraska, which is this big yellow dot at the top, which is a 2,000 mega complex proposed further out in Santa Monica that the model that I've been working with only projected over the next 30 years us to really grow about 175 more households. So it's not in a no climate gain area, but it's far more housing than some of the models suggest we'd want to necessarily build in an area like that if we're trying to be optimal about where we place housing. The limitations of this, there, I've tried to do them in a sentence. I think there are four of them. First, just one model. I'm working with just one model here. There are a lot of great greenhouse gas models. We're just using one. Second is this is just one city, Santa Monica. There are some cities where we don't expect really any climate gains for development. The city I grew up in, Clayton, in the East Bay, is 30 minutes from the freeway, has virtually no public transportation, has virtually no major office or retail centers. In other words, everyone gets in their car to go to work. Everyone gets in their car to go to the grocery store. Everyone gets in their car to see their friends. And they drive a long way when they do it. But Santa Monica is an example of a city where we expect people to be able to live more climate friendly lives. And it would be useful to be able to conduct this analysis in different areas so that we could gauge uh, the, the outcomes. Third is constrained data. The reason I chose Santa Monica, not for a particularly amazing reason, it's really because it's the only city in California that has a public database of builders remedy projects. Uh -huh. So that's great for me, for this project, but it's not great for doing our housing plan planning and policy. And the fourth is limited dynamic analysis. By this I mean, if you have a 2,000 unit proposal in a city, and you implement it, and you build that, you would expect that to change the vehicle miles traveled questions that we're dealing with here. You'd expect that to maybe change the, the likelihood that someone who lives in that neighborhood 
now versus after that project is built would be able to walk to the grocery store or walk to see their friends and family. So we aren't able to do the sort of dynamic modeling where we think about all those changes. Conclusions, housing policies can be climate solutions. And even when they're climate blind, they can be. This has been an example of that in Santa Monica. But when they're climate blind, they can create missed opportunities where we don't maximize our gains. And every ton of carbon dioxide equivalent matters when we're talking about climate change. And without rigorous data, policymakers can't be precise. Hopefully, projects like these can fill a small gap in taking us to that more precise future. Thank you. even at the local level, right? And like every town, every every town has their own housing element, right? And so, you know, Palo Alto, we have a lot of resources, and you know, not every town necessarily has those resources. We had a really nice presentation recently from Allison Ong about how sometimes these kind of localized uh, uh, approaches uh, can 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 create inequity because of differences between different communities. I was wondering, you know, what what are your thoughts on the housing element process? Like, I really uh, like uh, appreciate this because I think this is a way we can make it better. But it like it, can we make these kinds of tools to empower the housing element to make better decisions, more scalable, more accessible to like a wide range of yeah towns in in the state? Or is this something where like the housing element approach is kind of fundamentally challenging? Yeah, that's a great question. So. A little bit of history on the housing element process before this. If the, the housing elements have been generated by localities for many decades. And remedies like the builder's remedy haven't really been particularly available to folks in jurisdictions where they, the housing element has been non-compliant. In other words, it's kind of been like a meaningless document. It's a thing you produce. You like spend a bunch of money, you make this big report, and then nothing happens, and you don't build the housing. So I think the housing element is, and that's why everything costs so much. And I think that we're in a much better place today with housing element law than we were 10 years ago. Um, with that being said, I think you're right that the housing, the housing element process over the last uh, couple of years, getting ready for our new cycle, has demonstrated that while there are some cities that I think have poor housing elements because they're resistant to building housing in high-income areas, there are also just some cities that are so under-resourced and are sort of uh, um, inheriting a lot of mandates from the state that it's really challenging for them to think about how they grow, especially when they're, when they're in rural areas, yeah. in a way that's sustainable. And I think my hope would be, first of all, that if you can do this modeling in a sophisticated, intelligent way, you can make it open source and you can provide it to communities that really need it. But also, I think this is a good argument in favor of more state involvement. Oftentimes, I think we, we sort of have this sense that the state yeah. and the locality have the zero-sum power game. But the truth is that oftentimes the state has a really important supervisory role to play as, as a place with more resources. And we have all these climate regulators that are so uninvolved in the housing element process. We have the California Resources Board that has no land use jurisdiction. And just like these are just disconnected. These are about people in conversation, institutions in conversation with one another. So I think it would be great if we could have a less antagonistic way to have conversation between state climate regulators and people who are really smart about, smart about climate in the state and have more resources and localities that are trying to do this planning. Thanks for your question. Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, so you can go online right now. I think it's called like the Cool Climate Project. Uh, that sounds too catchy. So it's and it's not. It's definitely not that. But or like the California Cooling Climate. It's Cool Climate California. You Google it, and you can. There, there are these sorts of models online where you can play with them and kind of see like if I bring urban infill down, what happens? If I bring heat like electrification up, what happens? Um, and I think they're useful as like a broad level analytic tool when you're doing advocacy. But like they're not really a tool for a local government to be making decisions in part because so many, so many of them are static. They require a lot of expertise to be able to mess with. So I think that like as, a, uh, as an initial step, this is part, gets to the question earlier, I don't know of city tools that like localities have to be able to make these decisions, to be able to model different effects of their decisions. Regional governments have some of this. The regional government uh, allocation process I was talking about earlier, they actually do like different scenarios for affordability and for climate. So we know that these sort of resources exist. And I think it's about like 
putting these resources like in a chain with one another so that when you start at the state level and you're doing population forecasting and you come down to the housing element level, you're working with similar data and tools at each level. So that's a way to say I think that tools like these exist. I don't really think that they're in the hands of cities. I think that they're in the hands of folks who provide mandates. Thank you.